It's the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young from K-State Online here with you as we get set for the Wildcats and Cowboys game day finally getting to us. It's been a long, close to two weeks, not a full two weeks since K-State last took the field, since we do get this Friday game to see K-State in Stillwater, where the last two trips, uh, both under Chris Kleiman, have not gone the way of the Wildcats, but they are in much better positions with this current team than any of those last two were going down there. And certainly Oklahoma State in is, is in a much, much less favorable position than what they were when K-State went down there the last two times. So it will be one of those games where I think early on you'll probably get the kind of the feeling, you'll know one way or the other what this game will look like, whether it's K-State shows up and they're taking care of business or eh, this thing's going to hang around and be tighter than it needs to be all the way through. It's just like, you know, I, I hate to bring on my experiences as a Cowboys fan because everybody loves hearing from a Cowboys fan, but I knew from the get-go between their game with the Arizona Cardinals that that was the type of game that they were always going to be like jostling back and forth and probably going to lose in the end. It was just, I could tell by the pacing of the game and how everything has worked out in past years. Like I can tell what's coming. Uh, hopefully you don't get that feeling watching K-State. Hopefully the feeling you get is, oh, this is going to be easy. This game won't be close uh, from basically the opening whistle because I tend to think that's the way it goes. We know D.Y. earlier in the week feels uh, like it's still going to be a little bit of a dogfight just because Oklahoma State is in desperation mode. Uh, it's it's easy to see why you would think that, D.Y., because this is a team that just had their bye week. They need to get right because if they don't get right now, there's no fixing this thing the rest of the season. This is just going to be a wash of a year and bring on some very, very, very tough questions about Mike Gundy. So uh, real quick, just off the top, what is uh, the the initial vibe for you right now as we sit here, you know, a day plus away from kickoff between K-State and Oklahoma State? Yeah, just that this game will tell us a lot more. And I know this is a Kansas State podcast, so this is going to sound very counterintuitive. But this game will probably tell us a lot more about Oklahoma State than it will Kansas State because – this is the desperation mode for the Cowboys because, as you said, they just had a bye week. They're 2-2 two and two against a pretty poor schedule already, and it's not really going to get harder for them. Kansas State's probably the toughest, you know, maybe besides Oklahoma, you get Bedlam there. But they'll get up for Bedlam. They'll get up for Bedlam at their own 11. So not worried about that. So th this will probably be the best version of Oklahoma State that you'll see until the Bedlam contest. So uh, it's desperation mode. And you got to think for the Cowboys, it could be your last stand because if you lose this, you're two and three. You get blasted by South Alabama. You lost to Iowa State and Ames. You, you won dog fights against basically with Central Arkansas and Arizona State. And you're two and three. And yet, though, I, I didn't even think about it the way you put it, though. Put it, put it. Um, <laughs> You don't get another bye week, so you got to go eight in a row, eight weeks in a row here. Yeah, and if it piles up on you quick, like you're you're you just mail it in. It's a little bit of human nature. Now, I wonder how some of that doesn't come true because some of these guys with it's kind of the advent of the transfer portal. I wonder because when the transfer portal wasn't a popular thing, hardly anyone transferred. You didn't really have to worry about mailing in the remainder of the season. But now other teams are watching these guys and might take them the next year. So you wonder if the transfer portal almost keeps teams together a little bit longer than it, than they normally would. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, the, it, it is, it's, it's a daunting thing to face when you are not a good team. And if you don't get things right coming out of this bye week, you're in some serious trouble because there's no other point in the season where you can go ahead and, and stop the bleeding if you're if you're Oklahoma State or K State. I mean, that's why K State's win against UCF was so big. It really didn't matter how it came. It was just the fact that hey, you get that win, you go into the bye week, you're feeling better about yourselves, and then you focus on restarting the season. I mean, Oklahoma State gets the next two weeks at home. That's at least a benefit to them. But it's against K State and KU, uh, two teams that we've established are probably inside the top four of the league. I mean, you can debate where you want to put KU right now, but they're certainly no lower than like sixth probably uh, they also have a road trip to West Virginia after that that's a, a lot tougher now than what we would have anticipated uh, and we obviously know they still have Oklahoma left on the schedule and 
I don't think Oklahoma is going to take that game lightly uh, in the last matchup. So we'll have to see how it goes down. But this is this is a big game for Oklahoma State. The the thing is, and, and where I've been coming from, I just don't think it matters. I mean, bad teams play big games all the time, and most of the time they go out looking like who we thought they were. I mean, shout out Denny Green, but. I think Oklahoma State is who we thought they were, and they're going to prove that on Friday night in Stillwater. And K State's going to help them do it by, you know, shoving the football down their throat and beating them by three touchdowns. So I think I, I think it'll be tight for a half. But as you alluded to, um, Oklahoma State's a blink away from being zero and four in the Big Twelve, probably. Yeah. Yep. It could. I mean, it could tumble real fast. And I mean, you can look at it if they don't. If they don't look competitive, if they don't win some of these games coming up, it's certainly not out of the question that they could really struggle to find wins anywhere in the the Big Twelve this season. I mean, our Big Twelve power rankings that you compile each week, they were consensus number fourteen out of fourteen. This yes. Week, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Everybody had them at the bottom. So that's not that's not a great sign for you. No, uh, it's not. Not when when you also. It's not a great sign when you are by far and away number fourteen. When you're basically competing for that spot with Iowa State, Baylor, Cincinnati, and Houston. And Houston, like if everybody thinks you're worse than Houston, it's not going well for you. Which is crazy because Oklahoma State didn't even play last weekend. And two of the teams that are competing for that bottom spot with them got beat by 30 points over the weekend. So it's and, it's really and, not like, you know, that it's pretty clear that people think you suck right now if you're Oklahoma State. Yes, and Houston's already got a, lo- a loss to Rice this year. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. And uh, the Rice loss is probably worse than South Alabama, although JT Daniels, I keep seeing his name in like top 10 uh, statistical lists. So I guess he's uh, rejuvenated his career a little bit down there. South Alabama, since uh, beating Oklahoma State by nearly four touchdowns, has lost to Cent- – now, these are also good group of five schools, so I'm not totally trying to disrespect it, but they've lost to Central Michigan and James Madison. <laughs> uh, yeah. Huh? The, you know, James Madison's having a good season. They might uh, win the Sun Belt. That. They might yeah. win the Sun Belt, but I believe they technically can't play in a Sun Belt championship game. Oh, that's probably true. They just transitioned, so yeah. the NCAA is going to ax them on that. Uh, we'll talk about something with the NCAA at the end of the show real quick, but uh, first, let's dive into it. we have I mean, Oklahoma State probably has a myriad of concerns heading into this game, but what concerns you for K-State coming into this game? Like, where are they vulnerable? Is it something that Oklahoma State can do to them, or is it more so just concerns with K-State and uh, maybe what they look like coming off the bye, dealing with some of the health problems. Where are the concerns for this uh, Friday night matchup? Not overly concerned with health. I mean, you can make a case, man. Kansas State's probably healthier than they even were in week one, um, notwithstanding the injuries at linebacker to both Daniel Green and Issa Newsom. But I would I would say it's more beating yourself, I think, is because I don't know if Oklahoma State can go out and do it. Now, I will say this. You give Mike Gundy a couple weeks, like he might be outdated, stupid in some ways, and not have the personnel that he typically does. But he's he's a, he knows ball, so you give him a couple weeks, he can probably exploit some of the things that have been ailing the the Kansas State defense in terms of the big play. So it would not shock me if Oklahoma State can rattle off a few big ones, and if they can do it early, maybe they make it a competitive game. I think my only concern coming into this would be that if you're K-State, you overthink coming off the bye and what you have to do to beat a team like Oklahoma State where maybe you try to get too cute in a couple of areas or just a couple of things early on that you do that doesn't go your way and it, it kind of shell shocks you to knock you off your game and, and your plan throughout the rest of it. And so then you – not even to what Oklahoma State is doing, but you let the game stay closer than what it should be or what it could be, or you at least have the mentality of that. I, I think that's really the only thing. I think the mental side is huge in this because Oklahoma State, again, the way that they are constructed right now, the way that they are playing, they should not be in a situation where they can beat any of the good teams in this league. And I know it's tough to find good teams in the Big 12 right now, but 
you think if they go up against Texas, they have no shot in that game. If they go up against Oklahoma, I know it's a rivalry game, and what I, it's in Stillwater this year, they have no shot in that game. They should not have a shot against K-State. And really, again, I can go down the list a couple more times, and I can start to say to myself, I don't know that there should be a, a, a shot here. So we'll see uh, how that ends up working out. All right, well, we talked about what might concern you in this game for K-State, but there are probably a lot of things that you feel pretty good about for a K-State team that is facing an Oklahoma State team as bad as what Oklahoma State is. So uh, let's let's go to the positive side of this, D.Y. What can K-State do well in this game? Like, you are 100% confident they are going to do this to Oklahoma State. Kind of what you're – on your question of the week this week, I think you nailed it. I think they're going to throw it around the yard this week. And and I wonder if there's a little bit of posturing here by Chris Kleiman, who just like just hammered home line of scrimmage, line of scrimmage, line of scrimmage throughout his entire press conference on Tuesday. And then uh, now we're actually going to throw it a bunch because Oklahoma State can't defend the pass too well this year, one of the worst in the country. I think Will Howard is so close to being – a at least a very reflective of what his best performances were last year. I think Keegan Johnson, uh, just the twinkles in the eyes and talking to people around the program makes me think that he's about to take off and can really explode perhaps for a potential big game. You have it two weeks ago on tape where DJ Giddens has over 200 rushing yards. So Oklahoma State is probably pretty occupied and worried about that that could open up the passing game in the situations there um a lot to like about the passing game on offensively uh for friday night so i love that matchup for kansas state and maybe being able to exploit that uh in a way that they probably haven't necessarily done so this year at least being very consistent with it and executing at a pretty high rate i i feel good about that and defensively I think the pass rush has been pretty good all year. Uh, Oklahoma State's offensive line, probably fine. But, man, if Alan Bowman's the quarterback, not a guy that can really get away from a rush, I I think you can really affect what he's doing. And they've had no – man, I just – they're as bad as – and this is going to sound contradictory because I was like, you know, Kansas State, they're giving up the explosives. I think Mike Gundy can scheme a couple things up in an off week and hurt you from time to time, but there is very little to be worried about when, when speaking about the Oklahoma state offense. Yeah. I mean, you, you can go and and look at what has taken place to Oklahoma state uh, in the, not this, their last game against Iowa state, but you talked about the pass rush. They allowed three sacks at Arizona state and they allowed four sacks to South Alabama. So it's certainly a spot that if you know you have a team that's capable of doing it, they they can make it happen. Uh, Iowa State only managed one on Oklahoma State in their game, but you know that, I don't know that Iowa State was bringing the pressure necessarily. And we know Iowa State they lost their top edge rusher from a season ago in Will McDonald, so that certainly hurts them. K State is at the top of the Big Twelve still, at least in terms of a per game basis on sacks, because the two teams above them have played one more game now. Uh, but they're still in third relative to a lot of other teams that have played five games and they've played just four. So I am with you. I also think K-State can get to the quarterback. And because I think it's a blowout, I mean, think of how many times you watch a game and the score starts to kind of stretch away and it just feels like for whatever reason, the quarterback is now having less and less time to throw the ball. I think it's just a mentality thing. When it rains, it pours. And if this is a you know double double-digit lead early for K-State, it's just going to probably feel like Alan Bowman has no time and Khalid Duke and Brendan Mott, Nate Matlack. And, you know, if you're bringing linebackers down, are going to be right on top of him. So I'm confident in that. And then, yeah, you're right. I mean, question of the week, I wrote about it. I think Will Howard's going for 300 yards passing in this game. Um, he threw for 296 against them last year, and this was a better secondary a season ago. Now this is an Oklahoma State team coming off a game where they gave up over 300 passing yards to Rocco Beck, the freshman at Iowa State, who had not proven he could do that in any game up to that point. Um, I know he, I know he, slant, you know, threw it around pretty well against Oklahoma, but that was really only for a half, and even in that, he still threw some picks. Um, 
And then they also, you know, they let Central Arkansas throw for over 270 passing yards on him. So that's an area where I really think K-State takes advantage of it. Plus, you're coming off of a bye week if you're K-State. You're, you're banking on health, and you're banking on better integration of some of these receivers with Will Howard. And obviously, you talk about Keegan Johnson. That's a, a really good thing to hear for uh, the Wildcat fans out there that there's the twinkle, the glisten uh, in, the, uh, in the staff members that think that uh, some good things might be coming. And uh, I think Drew and I are both on this, but Keegan Johnson, that first touchdown, probably coming this week. That's, that's where we're both aligned with. Maybe you feel the same way. Uh, and we'll, we'll not the first touchdown of the game, just in general. Anytime. Yes, just in general, anytime. Yes, yeah. I'm not going to be so bold and be like, yeah, Keegan Johnson first touchdown of the game. Uh, that's reserved for Jaden Jackson. Oh, uh, Jaden Jackson, uh, DJ Giddens, Avery yeah. Johnson. Oh yeah, Avery Johnson. Yeah, I mean Avery had a, could have had a chance at Mizzou to have the first touchdown if he broke one off there. Uh, I mean Will Howard is always a bet because they like to just kind of sneak him out there. Although. It's almost getting to the point now where they've done that so much where, you know, yeah. the, the thought of Will being immobile, probably <laughs> these teams are aware of it. It probably takes away your ability to just kind of sneak him and walk him in. Yes, and Kent State might be less willing to do so. So it might be more of an Avery thing. Mm -hmm. Keegan, probably not bold enough to go first. To, I'm, we're just having fun here with first <laughs> touchdown kind of thought here. Ben Simmons, probably your best option. Yeah. Yeah, you're or, probably or, right. Or DJ, or DJ. Yeah, yeah. I would say Senate or DJ. If you wanted, to, if you, if you're listening, if you're watching, and you want to go bold for the money, first touchdown, Senate or Giddens, I think are the two best calls. Yeah, that's you're probably right. Those are probably the safe ones. Maybe not as much fun, but probably the safe bets uh, in this process. Uh, yeah, no, you, Phil's Phil's got it a few times too. Yeah, that's true. He got the one against Missouri. You know that that was a good start for him. Uh, we're talking – you mentioned D.J. Giddens there, so real quick on the running backs. Um, how do you expect the split of carries to play out now that we assume Treshawn Ward's going to be back and working his way into the rotation? I know we talked about it earlier in the week and maybe how we see the roles developing and changing from here, but if you had to put a number on carries that both running backs would see for K-State on Friday, where would you go with it? Yeah, the number's hard because – Kansas State, I doubt, runs 82 offensive plays again. So that, that that's going to come into play. Yeah, that was true. The UCF <laughs> put them in a spot where they could do that. I, I'd love to see it. I just don't think that's probably your norm. And then on the other side, you do have Trayshawn Ward coming back. On the other side, it's like maybe they go a little bit more pass heavier in this game. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. So I don't, I'll don't. i say like a percentage type thing maybe. Like I think it's somewhere between what was kind of the 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 first three game plan, and then like last week where you get like almost a hundred. Like because I think it's still going to be a share between the two. I just don't think it's going to be as even as we had seen at the first three games. Yeah, no, I, I think that's I think that's probably right. I think. Uh, especially the way DJ Giddens played. I mean, it, it's it would be hard to do something different there uh, and he not give good. him more than carry. He's I mean, yeah, good. he's awesome. Yeah. I mean, they're blessed to, to, you know, had the three years with Deuce Vaughn and could kind of go right into DJ Giddens and also still have Trayshawn Ward there in a pinch if you need it. So, uh, no, I mean, DJ Giddens, I wouldn't say that's his first start because he probably technically got a start somewhere else in those first three games. But for a guy that it was his first game being told, hey, you're the freaking guy tonight. Mm -hmm. And in the freaking game he played, he almost has one of the best running best games for a Kansas State running back in school history. So. Yeah. And they just said, hey, we're gonna we're gonna keep giving you the football. Uh to the extent where I Chris Kleiman didn't even seem aware of just exactly how many times they let him run the ball against it's probably because because they threw it to him eight times. They probably didn't expect that either. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you, you get in there after the game. It's like he touched the ball 38 times tonight. You're like, oh, crap, really? And But, yeah, 30 carries, which is a little bit on the high end if you think about, like, college football and and where things go now. But then you throw the eight, eight passes on to it because, I mean, I'd have to go back and look. But what do you think the most carries in a game Deuce Vaughn got at K-State was? 
I don't know if Deuce ever got thirty. I'll I will uh, I'll give you I'll give you a little bit uh, as I look it up and check. Okay, I have the highest from last year in there. Um, he hit that number once in twenty twenty one as well, uh, and he definitely didn't hit it in twenty twenty. I can tell you that they they weren't giving it to him as much then. Okay, so I have the number for you. Do you want to do you want to throw a guess out there? Carries right. Carries yeah, just carries. So he did it twice. Thirty-two. Uh, no, twenty-six was the most carries oh. Deuce Vaughn ever got in a game. I, I thought you said when he did do it twice, you meant like. Oh no, no, no! Yeah, no, I meant his his career high in carries. He did. Yeah, I would have guessed twice. before before I, I misunderstood you. I would have guessed twenty-seven. So I'd okay, close. yeah, that'd be close. Yeah, he had twenty-six in the Big Twelve title game against TCU last year, and then this one probably won't come as much of a surprise to you. He had 26 in the Southern Illinois game where Skyler got hurt and Will had it come in at quarterback in 2021. So See, I would have thought it might have been like the game where he had to play quarterback against Texas as well. Uh, he had 24 carries in that game, so he was close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that, I thought we were done talking about that game in, in K-State circles. I think we're just trying to, to block out 2021 Texas uh, from the memory bank. That's not a that's not a fun time. All right, Corey, Corey Messingham has. <laughs> yeah, well, or has he? I mean, it's, it's the reason he lost a, a, a good job. Uh, so maybe it's always in the back of his head. Hey, don't don't run the same wildcat quarterback crap over and over again when it's not working with a a five five running back. What was uh, funny is that Texas was doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, except you know Texas has guys that are physical specimens of another world back there. Uh, obviously Deuce Vaughn can do a lot of great things and was a great running back. That's not how you would describe him though. You would describe him as a very like standard size, a below size in some categories type of guy. Uh, all right, let's, let's roll on here. Get going with uh, some more thoughts on this game between K state and Oklahoma state tomorrow. Talked about what's worked, what might concern you when it comes down to it, how do you anticipate this game playing out from the pacing of it, how it starts? I mean, I know you're thinking it's probably going to be a little bit closer early on, but w what should people be prepared for to watch unfold in front of them? Because everybody knows my thoughts on this by this point. I've been harping it all week long. This is going to be a domination. K-State, we know, is going to go down and score Coach a touchdown. Bro. It's going to, it's going to, yeah, score on the first drive, and it's going to be on from there. Maybe O State matches with a score on the, the, the their first drive of the game, but after that, I think it's probably one of those where things kind of get stretched out. So, uh, where where do you see it? Because your answer is probably a lot more entertaining on this than mine is. Yeah, I would say that I do think it's competitive for at least a half, maybe a little bit longer than that, because I see this as more of a Missouri type thing, where you're playing on the road against the team with their backs against the wall that has to have this game and they put up their biggest fight of the year. And I truly think that's what we're going to see from Oklahoma State. And then add that to the fact where they had a little bit of extra time to prepare and they probably schemed up some tricks and some little gadgets and toys throughout the week that are going to work that exploit the inexperience of your defense. Now, maybe that wears off at some point. I think it will. And at the end of the day, it won't be good enough to win just because Oklahoma State doesn't have the same personnel that Missouri has. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's probably more than fair. I I can I can see that being a possibility. I just I look at it, man. K State, even for all the flaws that we've seen this year, they are still a much better team than Oklahoma State. They have better talent than Oklahoma State, and very rarely can you say that, but you look at it at what's developed here. K-State has better talent. I just think that they go out there, they're focused. And honestly, I think that the Missouri loss and how that played out has probably reinvigorated uh, a lot of these guys and has them you know, hyper-focused to some extent on making sure that this stuff doesn't happen and, and get dropped because you know we talked about it on, on Wednesday, but you think about – the circumstances in which, you know, guys go into a game and you don't want to use what happened last year if you won in a blowout because only bad things can happen from that. Whereas Missouri and Oklahoma State, they have the benefit of going into this. What happened to them last year against K-State is legitimate motivation because 
they can't take anything good they did from that game, but they can use it to fire them up. And so they'll have that advantage. But I think K-State, even though you beat this team 48 to nothing and the second you see Pistol Pete on the side of the helmet, you're going to go, man, remember when we kicked their butts last year? That was fun. I think that they're going to be able to erase that and just focus and treat this as any game they got to go out and take care of business, similar to what they did to Oklahoma State last year. And at the end, I think the manifestation of that is going to be a blowout win especially because you're facing a much worse Oklahoma State team than what was in Manhattan a season ago. Yeah, uh, it's all fair. And look, if Kansas State goes out there and plays their best game of the year, which is potentially what happens just because this is the healthiest that they've been even more Mm -hmm. than week one, and they limit the explosive plays even a little bit and cut it in half from what we've been accustomed to seeing from that defense, then this game's not close, and it probably looks more like last year's game. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. All right, uh, looking around at some other things within this game. Offensively for K-State, we've talked a lot about the passing attack and how that goes down. If, if you were calling this game, you are calling Klein for one day, and you get to be calling Klein at, you know, what, whatever, 32, 33 years old, what he is right now, offensive coordinator of K-State, you, you're not calling Klein taking 1,000 hits in a game, a guy that is carrying the ball. 30 times or more. Uh, how are you calling this game? Like, what are you doing to split up pass versus run? Who are you trying to get involved? Are you taking my approach of saying, Will Howard's a damn good quarterback? We've got receivers getting into better shape now. We've got to try and, and learn how to do this in game at some point with the downfield passing. Let's do it against a team that we can expose. Just throw, 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 and supplement with the run. Or are you thinking, Hey, you just ran the ball really well, you got capable runners. Treat this like you would any regular game and, and find the balance that you normally would. Yeah, I I put the game on my quarterback just because Oklahoma State is, uh, you know, allowed better quarterbacks, bigger games, or worse yeah. quarterbacks, yeah. bigger games. Like Rocco Beck threw for with 350. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I put the game on my quarterback. I might close with DJ Giddens, but until then I'm throwing it around the yard. I don't know. Based off the way I've been talking, I think K State might be closing this game with Jordan Shippers. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. If, if you really have broken their spirit for a half and just are throwing around all over the yard and they're ready to say, I quit, that's the time to smash them with DJ again. <laughs> wow. Oh, so yeah, I mean, you're on, you're saying, hey, this could be a closer game, but you're like, yeah, yeah, if you've yeah. got him, if you've got him, like, you know, uh, one blow away from death, you're like, yeah, just kill him, you know? I know. I mean, I I feel like you're you're pumping me up so much. I'm like, I'm going from this game being like a 10 to 15 point game to like a 30 point game. You're fire, you're revving my engine here, man. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I've got you fired up. Uh, we, we talked about defensively, K State getting to the quarterback, something that we, we both feel like they might be able to do in this game. Um, but how, how do you see this playing out for those guys in the secondary? Because you are facing a team that they're going to throw the ball a lot, but they're not necessarily good at it. That was something that that fan told us during the Sunday show when we previewed the game. Um, how, how do you think they respond to this week off, a little bit of learning time, and going in to face an opponent that's going to give them a lot of opportunities, but doesn't necessarily have the talent that some of the other teams in the league have that they'll face down the, down the road? Yeah, I'm not real sure because I, I think this is a group that probably just needs more game reps. Now, if you take a bunch of reps in practice, you could still improve. But herein, again, I'm going to say is what I would imagine is if there's some little tweaks and wrinkles here from the Oklahoma State offense that is designed to capitalize just off of what we've seen ail the Kansas State defense already this year. Like, that's what – Gundy's been telling his offensive staff, like, see this crap that they keep messing up on? Let's figure out plays, wrinkles, designs, concepts to take advantage of that. It'll probably work a few times. So that that's kind of what I expect. All right, let's shift into it. If the Wildcats are to get a win here, who are your game MVPs? Give me one on offense and one on defense and why uh, those guys are your pick. Offense. It is really starting to – I'm going to say Will Howard, yeah, because I think you put the game on a quarterback at least to to really, really get you going. And, and I think that he is very, very close to having one of those games where we were very 
you know, complimentary of last year. I, I think we're on the doorstep of that when it comes to what Will Howard is doing on the field. If if you wanted to say Keegan Johnson, I would get that too because I think we're almost there for Keegan Johnson mm-hmm. as well. I might wait a week, but this could be it. And defensively, I feel like I say Khalid Duke every week. So, <laughs> I mean, it's I think I said Brennan Mott once. I'm, I'm, it's hard to say the back end of the defense when I think they're going to be exploited a little bit. Mm-hmm. I don't – all right, well, I'll, I'll I'll let you pick one of the defensive ends, but then let's let's change this question for you a little bit. Like, name a breakout guy, then a guy that you think, we, like we know Oklahoma State's going to throw it a lot. The secondary will get their fair share of challenges. Like, which guy in there then could have the breakout game to where we start to see the secondary turning the corner, and there's this really bright spot because whoever it is had had a really good game for him. I mean, they've obviously they made the switch with the safeties. Uh, switching Kobe Savage and VJ Payne around, uh, you know, where they're positioned on the field. And then obviously the corners are all inexperienced at this level. So I'll let you answer it that way. May- maybe make it a little bit more interesting for you than just saying, hey, your best player on the defense is probably Khalid Duke right now. Khalid Duke going to get to the quarterback. Like it, everybody's probably along those same lines. So, yeah. And, and I think there's a chance of Marquis Siegel kind of comes around just because he is an older player, um, not just a first year player for Kansas State. He is but he still has some veteran leadership. He still has some playing experience elsewhere and someone that probably uses that by week to nestle in even more and kind of hones in on what his responsibilities and duties are. So maybe Marquis Siegel is a good choice on that front. Yeah. Okay. All right. I like that. Well, for me, it's Will Howard. Everybody knows this. I've been a Will Howard guy from the get-go this year. Uh, look, it only took three years of him before I, I was on the Will Wagon. Uh, after uh, I was, I was certainly, oh, probably, I was probably oh, a ringleader man. of the Will Howard disdain the first two years. I will not uh, deny that. Um, I'm sure that you could go and find some really negative tweets of me for Will Howard. I think I even compared him to Carson Wentz a couple of times his first two years, which was not nice of me because we all know Carson Wentz is not a very good quarterback at this stage in life. Um, but I think it is Will Howard because he is a very good quarterback. And even though there have been some struggles this year that were maybe unexpected, it's going to get fixed. Like we we saw enough last year to know that him being off with these deep shots, that's not going to continue to happen. You're facing a team that is susceptible there. And I mean, it's not to the same level because obviously Will Howard is not this guy, but think about what USC did offensively last week against Colorado. They went into that game. And they knew that Colorado was very much a weak in you know liability defensively going into that game. So they were just going to throw it at him because they said, hey, Caleb Williams is the best player on our team, maybe the best player in college football. We're going to let him do this thing. And what he did was 30 of 40 for 400 yards and six touchdowns in the game. And USC only let their running back touch the ball 13 times in the game. So – this is the same type of situation for K-State, except Oklahoma State is probably worse than Colorado. K-State just isn't as good as what USC is offensively. But you look at Will Howard, you're the guy, you have all this talent, go out there, let it rip, uh, and knock some guys off their feet, and, and let's go. So I, I do think this is a massive game from Will Howard, and I think it's uh, one that gets everything back on track and probably gets the monkey off his back a little bit from the people that are just panicked and needing to, to point a finger at a quarterback this season. It always happens. That's fine. That's how football and fandom works. Uh, but I think this is going to be a, a good game for Will Howard just because the opportunity is there. And I think Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein realize it, and they want to give Will Howard and the receivers that opportunity. Yeah, this it's got a big game written all over for him. All right. Uh, then my, my next pick right here, uh, defensively, because I will take a guy in the secondary and – He's obviously, I think, the guy that we look at and say, okay, the potential for what he can be is pretty big. He's already got a pick under his belt this year. I'm going Will Lee. I think that Will Lee is a guy that if Wildcat. you're – Yeah, Will Lee Wildcat. Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking that any of these players in the secondary could turn into something this season of significant importance where you know they're, they're making plays, like they're seeking out to make plays, I think Will Lee is probably that guy. Like 
I think Jacob Parrish very well could end up being the most consistent corner for you this season if you're K-State. But I think Will Lee is going to be the guy that it's like, oh, we need a pick right here. Who can do it? It's going to be Will Lee. I think just there's there's some kind of instinct and talent level that he has that I would go with him. But it's a shot in the dark because I'm with you. Like I look down and it's like I'm either picking Khalid Duke or Brendan Mott for this in this game because we think they're getting the quarterback. But let's make it a little bit more interesting. And I'll just pick a guy in the secondary that struggled that I think has the potential to do something really good. Pick six. Yep. You ready for it? A little best bets action now. Uh, here, I'll, D.Y., you get to go first here. There is a look, if you're watching on the YouTube, what D.Y. has picked uh, this week. Now, there you could argue that depending on where you look, you may not get the number for the first quarter over, uh, but I will vouch for D.Y. I saw it at 10.5, so uh, he gets to pick it at 10.5. Either way, I think 10.5, 12.5 are the numbers I saw. I think both of those are, are a good bet to go over. Yeah, I, I, I said – I sent that to you a few days ago when the number wasn't even out. So I was like, it doesn't matter what it is. Give me the over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you also are taking Miami minus 11 and a half against Bowling Green, even though the Falcons are coming off a massive win at Georgia Tech. That's why. Got to fade them. And my Ohio, pretty solid this year. Already got a win over Cincinnati. And the final one, I, probably the one I like the most. Look, TCU, I think that's supposed to be under 30 and a half. But uh, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> then shoot. I may that have to go back me. and read. The, or that might have been me uh, just typing wrong in the email itself. But uh, I, TCU under thirty and a half is actually what I like there against Iowa State. The Cyclones are going back home to Ames. Some of their defensive numbers this year. If you just look at the raw point total, you'd say, "Man, what's wrong with the Iowa State defense?" You dig into it. The Iowa State defense is still fine. Like there's okay. some special teams touchdowns. There's some touchdowns for the other team's defense. That's not the Iowa State defense. And plus TCU, offense overrated. Kendall Bryles overrated. Mm. TCU just lost at home to West Virginia. I mean, do you think TCU could score 31 on Iowa State names? I sure uh, do not. No, probably not. If they just if they just scored only 24 at, or 21 at home against West Virginia, and you think about Oklahoma State, it felt like Oklahoma State had a really good offensive day and they only scored 27. So – yeah, you're probably right here. And I, I did look. You had it right. My reading comprehension was bad. I, I wrote over, uh, and I read it as over earlier. It's clearly the under. So I don't want anybody watching this on YouTube to get confused. DY is not a clown. Uh, TCU <laughs> under 30 and a half this weekend. Okay. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if they went under 20. How about that? Yeah, I mean, this that could be another really ugly game. I think with Iowa State, any game that they're in this year – you just have to be prepared for something really atrocious to show up on your TV screen. Yeah, uh, their, their, their offense is bad enough to make it ugly, and their defense is good enough to make it ugly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Here, here's a look at mine. Uh, I, too, am taking Miami to cover this week, D.Y. I'm taking the Hurricanes minus <laughs> 20 and a half against Georgia Tech. Uh, Miami has actually, you know, I'm typically a Miami hater. If you give me Miami – Texas, Notre Dame, some of these big brands that people are just dying to be good. I kind of think they're frauds. Um, unfortunately, I think Miami is not a fraud this year. They've kicked everybody's butt. Uh, I thought, you know, like Texas A&M was going to go in there and beat them. And I don't even like Texas A&M. I just was like, Miami, not the real deal. Miami beat them 48 to 33. Miami is yeah. going to put up points on Georgia Tech. And I just don't know that the Yellow Jackets are going to be able to uh, keep it anywhere within that realm i mean georgia tech has been able to score at least 30 points on some scrubs this year but they uh have have had their struggles obviously with the likes of bowling green and ole miss um and miami probably in a similar vein to what ole miss is right now uh so i am going to take the canes uh with the the big number of 20 and a half so i see your second one there and and i will tell you this i've been asked about this game many times because at this point of what I do, I, I'm mm -hmm. apparently on 12 different shows during a week asking about games. I like Baylor in this one. Now, I'm not putting money on it in any certain way, but Baylor is the home team with what I believe is probably the best quarterback in the game. I think that matters. I do think that Blake Shapin's return is a game changer, but, I mean, Tech is like the drug that I just can't quit right now. I'm a little I, that way. <laughs> I still just think, like, man, they – they should be better than what they are. Like there's a chance that what we saw at the end of last year and what they ended up winning eight games and 
the talk of them maybe being in Arlington. Yeah, that was probably too much, but they are not as bad as what they have shown. I I just, I, I can't believe it, especially with as bad as Baylor has been at times, you know, even minus shape and not being there. Uh, I, I'm riding with the Red Raiders one last time. And then, of course, probably the time that I'll get off the wagon is when K-State goes down there next week and then Tech will finally show up and be like, oh, this is the team that we thought we'd see all along. And K-State fans will be like, crap, we just lost to Texas Tech. So, yeah, what I will say, if you're a K-State fan, and obviously if you're watching or listening to this, you probably are, root for Baylor this weekend. Because yes. if Tech's sitting there, what this would make them – if they lost that, what are they, 2-4, and 0-1-2 oh and, and in the Big 12? Like – the yeah. energy is probably not going to exactly be there in Lubbock if that's the case. Now, if Tech goes out there and blasts – or doesn't even blast them, beats Baylor, now they're 2-1 and one in the Big 12. Now they don't have a losing record anymore, and you're playing them at night. Um, at, is it still Jones AT&T Stadium? Yes, what they I call believe it, it so, is. So if Texas Tech wins at Baylor, that place is going to be on fire the following week. All right, then my last one, uh, my one from the K-State game, Keegan Johnson. The touchdown is happening this week. I mean, yeah. they're going to be throwing the ball. He came so, so close uh, in what that was the game against Troy. Came up just short, and hopefully with this week off, you know, you get him integrated better. The health is better. There's just a lot of things that suggest that this is probably the week that it happens. You can also get good value on it probably still. I mean, I think Drew told us last night that's still like plus 475. Uh, in in some places so that feels pretty good especially like if you wanted to pair that you know you can always do these same game parlays and again i'm i'm an idiot despite the fact that i've had a probably a good two week stretch here uh you could pair that with i think will howard his his passing yard so it's still like 255 and a half i mean i think both of us at this stage think he's going over it you can debate on if he gets to 300 or not but he's probably going over that so you know, pair of those, you got yourself a nice little payday if you, you throw a little coin on that before you hit the Oklahoma the, border on Friday. Yeah, and with the first quarter over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. You've got you got a perfect batch right there uh, to, to let it rip. So uh, one last look there. There are the best bets this week. And I promise people are probably like, oh, Mason's getting his ass kicked in this. That's why he's not showing the scores on the YouTube. Uh, look, I played it around. I played around. I was trying to simplify the, the graphics, make it look cleaner. And I need to find a way to get the records back on there. So I promise next week the records will be back that will show, yes, DY is beating me, uh, but I'm not trying to dodge that fact. Like I, I think I'm three and six right now, and he's like six and three or, or seven and two. He's something like that. He's doing really well on these. So I just, I didn't want anybody to think, oh, he's dodging it. He's going to try and change the rules here. No, I'm getting my butt kicked. It's okay. I can take a loss every once in a while, but hopefully we get back on track this week. If the first quarter over doesn't hit, it's probably because Oklahoma State didn't score, which would mean Kansas State's probably pulling away. Yeah, right. you're, so. you're probably looking at K-State up like 10 nothing or something because okay. that, that was kind of maybe the concern with uh, like the UCF game with how things went out, and they, they responded. You're like, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, it worked out. I like the first quarter over in probably every K-State game this year, unless it gets to some astronomical number. It seems like a likelihood because you have a really good offense with a defense that is allowing some explosive plays right now. Yeah, and the defense does settle in at times, but not until the second half. Yeah. All right, uh, let's let's move back to K-State, Oklahoma State. We've talked about it in great length. Give me a score prediction for K-State, O-State, now that uh, we, we've we gone through and talked up basically every corner of this game. Yeah, you guys know, I feel like Oklahoma State can, can hang around a little bit just because I think they're going to get – Enough big plays on offense, despite their personnel lacking the maybe playmaking ability to do so. I could be very off in that just because I agree. They don't have the playmaking ability to do so, but I still think they do it anyway. So I have a 35-23. Okay, there you go. That's uh, it's not as It's not as big and exciting of a win as I think. Still a cover. Yep, that's right. Uh, yeah, K-State's an 11 and a half point favorite right now. And they're like very, like it's, the odds are very skewed in their favor. I think when I looked earlier, it was like, you could get O-State minus or plus 11 and a half at like minus 102. So they, it, they, they feel pretty good about, uh, how some of this might go for K-State. Yeah. And that would suggest that the line's probably even going to grow into yeah. the 12 range at some point. Yeah. I look, I, I think the way that it goes down, I've been saying it's going to be a butt kicking, uh, like, all week 
And I would probably throw out there, I mean, I have to be a little bit more uh, precise with my score, but I'm going to say K-State probably goes out. And this feels like the type of game where they get into the 40s. And I don't know. I, I don't know if they settle for field goals in this one. I, I might say K-State 41, Oklahoma State 10. I, I, Oklahoma well, State gets a touchdown, but Mike Gundy also kicks a sad field goal at some point in the game. And you say K-State doesn't sell for field goals. So if we're getting 41, are we missing another extra point? Yeah, I think there's probably a missed extra point in there. That oh. that's yeah, I'm sorry. I, I know I hate to do that to your guy, DY, but <laughs> it's just uh it's just how it goes. All right. Transitioning into the rest of the Big 12 this weekend, a look around the league uh with the week six games. It's not as busy of a slate. And certainly if you're watching on Saturday, it's gonna feel really light because with K-State O State playing on Friday, there are only four games on Saturday, but it kicks off at eleven with uh the two traders, the two teams that will not be Big 12 teams next year. I, I also saw Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, is going to be in attendance at this game. Brett Yormark is not. He was asked about it, and he was basically like, hey, that's his future. Like, he should have that. He should have that day. There's no reason for me to be there, which I respect from Brett Yormark, but also, like, it's kind of goofy that in 2023, with all these teams the SEC currently has, their commissioner is going to be at a non SEC game uh, on Saturday. And then UCF KU at three, Tech Baylor at seven, TCU Iowa State at seven as well. Uh, we now know that game is on FS2. Uh, Wyoming and Fresno State won out the, the Fox slot over <laughs> TCU Iowa State. So uh, out of the four games on the Saturday, DY, which, uh, which one are you most excited about? Which one are you most likely to not watch at all? Well, I will not be watching – TCU Iowa State. I I I feel like I can find a better game at seven than that. Although I might watch a little bit for my betting purposes, right? Yeah. Because I do like have the TCU total under. But FS, why are we getting so many FS two games this year? I don't I don't know. Um, <laughs> Texas Tech Baylor. Uh, I mean, I'll watch the other three for sure. Um, even if I'm sharing the screen with a little bit of another game, I'm really not that interested in Oklahoma Texas, and it's. I probably will be when the time comes, but one, like I don't want to give them the satisfaction of that. And two, like I, I'm not saying it's going to be 49-0 again, but I think I think Texas dumps them pretty well. UCF Kansas is probably the one that I'm most interested in just because it's Kansas. And I think UCF does has, has a chance to win in Lawrence. But in terms of the one that's the most meaningful to K-State, um, well, one, K-State does need Texas to beat Oklahoma, in my opinion. So if you're a K-State fan, you should probably root for Texas because if Oklahoma wins, then that's probably going to be the Big 12 championship game because then K-State must beat Texas on the road to get to Arlington probably. Yeah. Whereas if Texas beats Oklahoma, you at least give yourself an out if you do lose to Texas and maybe get a worst-case scenario, get into a – tiebreaker scenario with Oklahoma. So root for Texas if you're a K-State fan. But in terms of the immediate future, I think the one that's more meaningful is Texas Tech at Baylor because you do play the Red Raiders the following week. Yeah, that's kind of one of those where you want Baylor to probably break the spirit of Texas Tech even more yep. and get them to the point where they're ready to mail it in. I mean, for me, uh, I look, it's not the game I'm picking is like my favorite of the week, but TCU-Iowa State, I will be watching that game. There is no <laughs> doubt I will be watching that game uh, to just kind of see what comes out of it because it's going to be disgusting and I can't wait to kind of watch that. I, I like these gross Big 12 games, at least with the schools that like are sticking around. The newcomers, I'm not going to watch. Like, like BYU Cincinnati, I only watch because it's on a Friday. If that was being played on a Saturday, I would not have cared. Um, I'm just not there yet with those schools. And then UCF Kansas is the one that I'm most interested in, like from a, a game standpoint. Obviously, like the Jalen Daniels drama that is going on is a big deal. So I'm excited to kind of see what goes on there. Uh, and then Texas, Oklahoma, I mean, I'll probably catch some of it just by default, but I'm with you. It, it could kick off and just like that, not be an interesting game again. Like the Oklahoma defense has to really prove they can stop a good team. And they have not done that now since, you know, I guess I could say the year 2021, but. I don't even know if they were stopping good teams in 2021. So yeah. it's and been I'll a be while. On, and I'll be on my way back. From, we'll 
both be, but I'll probably still yeah. be on the road. You might be at home by then, but coming back from Stillwater. So I'll miss yeah. the first half anyway. Yeah. And obviously last year, uh, you did not miss much if you missed any part of that game. So I don't know. We'll see. That, that's probably the one that I just by default of what's going on, I won't catch a ton of it. And it's not going to hurt my feelings one way or the other if I don't. Now, if it's a close game late, it will be on. I'll find it, but I'm not going to seek it out and I'm not going to, you know, be all in because at the end of the day, and I, I don't know how people feel about this in general. I've always been a guy that like it's K state and then it's the big 12. And since this game doesn't have a ton of bearing on the big 12 moving forward after this year, it just, it's not going to feel the same as it has in past seasons. So my interest level in it is, is definitely lower. Yeah, That's where I am. I also will be probably pulling for Texas for the reasons that I've already mm-hmm. stated, but also like we the, the attitude and the mantra and the personality of Texas is definitely insufferable, but they also don't deny it. They like, they are yeah, very accepting. True. They are very accepting and, and have a lot of self-awareness to realize, yeah, we are, you know, arrogant for no good reason and believe yeah. that the entire college football world revolves around us. Oklahoma thinks that, thinks that same way, but uh, th- they just lack the self-awareness. And I thought Oklahoma, for me, they're just, uh, for as much that they carried Texas in terms of maybe performance, like Texas still carries them. And, and Oklahoma's still riding the coattails of Texas yeah. when it comes to prestige, money, and clout. Like, yeah. And Oklahoma like wants to be Texas and tries to act like, I don't know, I, I just don't get a lot of genuineness out of Oklahoma. And to be honest, because of that, like I will probably revel in the fact that they are losing again by 40 to Texas. Yeah. And uh, it, it could definitely happen. All right. Uh, one final thing I mentioned it earlier. I want to get to, I want to get your thoughts on this uh, more so, so I can put mine out there. Uh, we saw today that the uh, FBS oversight committee is trying to put an end to the unofficial visit photo shoots that take place where None of like the the professional photography stuff can go on, like whatever. Uh, I'm all for this. I'm again, Scott Wildcat described it last week as me being like an old man in a millennial Gen Z body. I think it's the dumbest thing ever. It's just silly and dumb. Like, what? Who cares? And they get even more outrageous as they move on. Like, at least props to K State. They haven't jumped the shark too much. Uh, but obviously, we, we've seen the videos with Brian Kelly doing stupid dances and. And like the f- picture that was going around was like the the kid in, uh, visiting Florida and his dad was suited up with him and like it's just I don't get it it's it's pointless it has no bearing or shouldn't have any bearing on where these kids end up at uh, so I I think this is a good move by the uh, by the oversight committee and also probably uh, eases a massive headache on coaches that are like I'm here to coach football like I have to worry about a dang photo shoot right now with a kid so. Good on the FBS Oversight Committee for trying to get rid of these dumb things. Yeah, I guess I'm indifferent. Like, I, I think it probably lowers the burden on some people that are probably being stretched a little thin. Um, I'm not sure that they really had to intervene here. I don't know if that was necessary. I mean, you're right. This doesn't seem like the kind of thing that they really should have been focusing on. Uh, I'm sure there were a lot of other things that they could have probably worked a lot harder on. Uh, but yeah, well, you know, Hey, good, good for, good for them for making a move, make, taking a stand, you know, yeah. I just kind of, I don't know. I, I, I wish I had more thoughts on it other than just, ah, uh, you know, I think it's dumb, blah, 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 whatever, but I, it's, that's really just all it is. I'm, I, I do act like an old man sometimes. And I think that that stuff, like, why is it, why is it a thing? But you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, all right. K-State, O-State, it's coming your way this week, Friday kickoff, so you're getting the the pregame pod a day early. We will be in Stillwater. We will have full coverage of the game for you, pre, during, post, whatever you need. K-State Online has you covered, so make sure that you're locked in to the website on three and then also with the uh, social channels, YouTube, the podcast, because we will have content uh, all weekend long following the aftermath of K-State and Oklahoma State, seeing where the Wildcats sit. Obviously, they'd like to get out of Stillwater with a win, sit back, and have another Saturday watching the carnage in the Big 12 unfold in front of them. So, 
For Derek Young, I am Mason Vo. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO Show. We will be back on Sunday with myself, Drew Galloway, and KSU underscore fan for the postgame pod. And then DY and I will be on the field after the game, giving you our thoughts from Stillwater, as well as our full podcast with the, uh, the bow tying coming on Monday. So K-State, O-State, 630 kick Friday night on ESPN. That'll do it for K-State Online.